Hello and welcome to the Llama podcast. I'm Peter Bowes and Llama Live Long and Master Aging is where we explore the science and stories behind human longevity. Today I've come to the Irvine campus of the University of California to meet Olga Connolly. Olga is a personal trainer here. She specializes in exercise therapy and believes in a mind-body approach to fitness. Olga is 84 years old. She was born in Czechoslovakia where she enjoyed basketball and handball as a teenager but eventually trained to throw the discus. In fact she was so good at it she was selected to represent her country at the Melbourne Olympics in 1956 and went on to win a gold medal. It proved to be a momentous year. For Olga. It led eventually to her moving to the United States and taking part in another four Olympic Games representing her new home country. Well today as well as being a fitness instructor here in California she writes, lectures and motivates a lot of people. Olga it is an honor to meet you. Well, thank you very much. That was a very flattering introduction. Well, um. <laughs> it was quite a brief introduction to what has been an extraordinary life, and we'll fill in a few of the gaps in a second. But first, we're at UCI, University of California, Irvine. This is the recreation center where you do your training. Uh, tell us about this place. Okay, the Anteater Recreation Center is one of about three major parts of the athletics at the university. It's the University of California, Irvine campus. About 20,000 students attend here. It is a very international one. We have uh, literally students here from all over the world. And uh, it is fun to see as everybody meets in the gym and in their languages uh, are just sharing uh, their weightlifting experiences and so forth. We've just been I, in the gym together. It's a very multicultural place. Oh, yes, it? but it's more than that, too. So we, we, we are college students, right? And also college professors and administrators. Most of my clients, for example, are either professors or administrators who are just working out. The difference between the very the college students and them is pretty much that the college students are still wearing off their backs and their knees unnecessarily, but the professors already have worn them and now they are repairing them. And so uh, I do much of that repair and I'm so happy to see somebody who suddenly remembers that 20 years ago played basketball or football and uh, uses that as a motivational force in realization that there really isn't any age categories or any age boxes for people getting in shape. I love to do that. Yeah, I do motivate people. For example, it's really good when you have a gentleman who kind of forgot how to do a sit-up, and I say, oh, well, okay, I'll show you, and I can do 15 or 20 sit-ups, and I say, well, this is how you do that. And so immediately, the person who couldn't do one sit-up can do five or ten. And you show men <laughs> who are half your age how to do sit-ups. Okay, this age thing, it's really, it needs to be debunked, to use that word. Like Dr. Mario Martinez, who is a you know, he's a psychologist from Uruguay, and he's becoming to be rather famous because of his mind-body connection that, you know, was kind of a, kept separately in uh, Western culture, but it really has to be unified. If you really go uh, through uh, science of human development, you will realize that middle age starts at around 80 or 90, that it's been artificially pushed down to 40 or 50, but it actually is not until then because we are solidly built to live like 120. You know, you train your mind, and you train your body as one unity, and then it really gives you better results anyway. I train people that way. How long mm. have you worked here? I've worked, this is my 11th year. I see the 
rejuvenation or whatever every day. It's not that, wow, in a day or two you'll be young, but you start stripping off the artificial patina of being old, you know, like when you, for example, you may sprain your ankle and you are a student and people say, oh, oh, how did it happen? You sprained your ankle. If you are 50 or 60 years old, you sprain your ankle, people will say, oh, you have to remember that you are no longer 18. I can see it as a cultural brainwashing that really is not consistent in the science of human uh, development, kinesiology, and everything. And, uh, and I see the living proofs of it, and that's how I train people, and that's doing well. Well, I started by saying that you are 84 years old. You just <laughs> mentioned the age of 18. Can we go back to you as a teenager? Were you always an active girl? Were you always sporty? Yes, I was pretty much always sporty. Uh, I think primarily because back in Prague, and my family lived in a housing development in the middle of which was a sizable park. And there was not all that many cars driving in there, maybe two cars a day or something. So we kids played on the streets and we played just soccer games. Most people there had boys, had sons. There were only two girls. So the guys decided that the girls can play too, and they made me into a goalie. And I kind of got into sports that way. Once uh, there is something like talent, like some people can draw, you know, like somebody once told me that one person makes three dots on canvas and it's nothing, and another person makes three dots and it's a masterpiece. So there is some kind of an inner fire that you have actually the art talent for sports. I, I consider sports simply a physical expression of that particular talent, similar to dance, but just different. How did playing soccer and what handball and basketball as well, how did that translate into you becoming this world-renowned discus thrower? Oh, actually, it was a multifaceted training. Okay, every time you train, your brain, you get a more of a coordination pathways between your body and your brain. And the brain, of course, uh, makes connections. So you become more athletically coordinated person. Um, the rest of it was kind of an accidental. I started to play the handball just because uh, when I was already in high school, right, let's call it gymnasium, it was a high school, a friend of mine, they needed a goalie in the handball game they played. And so she came running in and she asked if I would try it. And so I did. We lost like 28-0. And another player from that particular club came and said I was the worst goalie she ever saw. But it was a little different to have tall goals rather than just a couple of trash cans on the road, right? So, okay, I got a little bit upset, and I, I said, I'm not that bad. And another player from the women's club there, she said, you didn't look so bad and I will introduce you to my boyfriend to train you, and the boyfriend happened to be the goalie for the Czechoslovak national team. So the next day, I headed to this fancy, fancy sports club, the Sparta club, and there's this young man, and he starts, uh, puts me in a soccer goal, and he starts kicking and throwing one ball, two balls, three balls, and then after a while of that, he said, go home, put something on the bruises and come back tomorrow. So that's how I started to be a goalie. And uh, eventually I was a goalie for the national team because it was fun. So when and, did you start throwing the discus? Oh, I started throwing the discus after I graduated from a, a gymnasium. And because um, there was, you know, where communism became... Um, uh, you know, got the rules in Czechoslovakia. My father, who used to be 
a member of the presidential guard of President Masaryk in those pre-war presidents. He was thrown in jail just because of that, for no other reason. And so I was thrown out of school. It took me two years. I worked in the factory, which was fun too. Well, anyway, I did get uh, accepted to medical school and I no longer had time for team sports. So I had to look for some individual activity. I had so many years of training. My body needed it, you see. And so uh, there was only one thing I've never tried, and this is discus throwing and javelin throwing, two things, actually. Everything else I came across in whenever, right, situations. I went up to a stadium where Dana Zatopek, an Olympic champion javelin thrower from Helsinki, and her husband, Emil Zatopek, that uh, became just a world-famous runner, right, been trained there. I consulted with them, and... Um, Dana said I wouldn't be a good javelin thrower because my shoulders are not built that way, but I could be a good discus thrower. Besides, there was one young man in discus throw in Czechoslovakia. He was really good looking, so it was good to get some coaching there. <laughs> so uh, I started to train for the discus. And my biggest motivation was when Emil Zatopek said... Uh, you train and in uh, two years, because it was roughly two years before the Melbourne Olympics, and we'll all go together to Melbourne. And I said, Emil, what's going on in Melbourne? And he said, the Olympic Games. And I said, the Olympic Games, what is that? And then Dana pulled off his shirt, a little sweatshirt, and handed it to me. And he said, well... The Olympic Games is the greatest thing that ever happened to modern humanity. And this shirt I'm wearing is the one I won the Olympic Games last time, and I want you to have it now. And if you train in it, you will go to the Olympic Games. So, and then we all went to the Olympic Games, and, uh, and I did well there. And, well, maybe that's a little <laughs> understatement. You did extremely well. You won a gold medal. <laughs> right. What are your memories of that moment that you realized that you clinched the gold? It was a little different then. Then everything was about, you were an amateur, you get some help, but you were not after any money, or anything like that. You were there to represent the country, the people you loved. You had this fire in you. I had fire in me just to make everybody happy. And of course, you when you are a competitor in anything, you do have a desire to win, but you also know there are other people who are just as good. So basically the desire is to get out of you in a given moment, physically, mentally, and spiritually, all you've got. Did you as know th when you went to Melbourne that you had it in you to win the gold medal? Did you believe that you could do it? I wished it fervently, but I would never say so. And it was just like saying, God... Please allow my feet to be the fastest and my technique the very best. <laughs> that type of thing. It was not so much about winning and losing. It was really about being there. By then, I already knew about the Olympic Games and Pierre de Coubertin. We were the biggest thing to be there and participate before the victory. So it was a kind of a mixture, you know, of feeling. You just try to do your very best. And, of course, when you throw the discus, you don't know instantly that you've won. No, you no, you don't. You have to see how it's far a, you manage to throw it. And then I guess there was, there's a period of time but, before you know that you've but won But you know, I think, I think there's more to it, too. When you are in the moment where everything goes right, you're kind of a part of... The moment you and the discus are one, and Abraham Maslow calls it uh, a psychologist. He called this um, a peak experience moment, and it could happen in you playing a piano, it could play a basketball game, and in that moment you are unbeatable because everything goes perfect. And that's the kind of moment. You kind of don't think, on oh, this row I have to win. You don't think that way. You just, uh, 
okay, they call your name and, and you do it. You just become it. As a matter of fact, my winning throw in Melbourne, I walked into the ring and everything turned dark around me. I didn't hear any people. I didn't, there was just dark. And as I, this is the first time I'm really sharing this, right? Uh, I, I went into the turn and when the discus left my hand, I could see kind of a bright line of energy, pure energy, like light. And then, then there was an applause and everything came back. But there was only an applause because it was the longest throw of the day. But there was one more round to go. And so I just lay down on the grass, put my face in the grass. I just lay there. But there was nothing else I could do because I knew... Because you had to wait to see what the next person For did. the next person. To, and I had one more throw. But I also knew that that effort took all I have. That was like all my energy was gone. I was like sucked out of me. So my next time I went in, I still get a very good throw, but not the longest throw, right? And then there were still two people, to, you know, and one of them was Nina Punamareva, who was the Olympic champion of the previous Olympics. And only then it was over, there was an applause, and an official came to me, and sh he tapped me on the shoulder, and he said, you can get up now, you won. So it was not like, you know, bumping your chest, I won. It was like, wow, <laughs> you know, it was kind of different, just this feeling of happiness, you know, I had some chocolate in my person so I pull out the chocolate and the other artists came and we just had a big chocolate party it was different then I don't know always different but there was so much more camaraderie and you know what camaraderie I think holds the human family together that's why I have such warmest recollection of that victory it goes beyond the victory itself it was a momentous moment for you. Uh, that year was pivotal in your life because at the same <laughs> Olympic Games, that's where you met the man who was to become your husband and a lot of controversy surrounded that and that's a very long and maybe separate story for another time. But you eventually moved to the United States yes. with your new husband and you took part in, what, another four Olympic Games yes. but you, you couldn't represent Czechoslovakia and again there was a lot of politics involved. You ended up representing the United States. Yeah, there was a kind of a political thing that uh, at that point uh, nobody was allowed to marry a foreigner. That was how it was in Czechoslovakia. So it was breaking this kind of a, this barrier of the Cold War, and we don't need to spend time on it because we are in another era now. But I did uh, promise the president of Czechoslovakia that, of course, I'll represent Czechoslovakia, the whole heritage in which I grew up, right? I will represent in Rome. And, but then before which Rome, I, the got, I received a letter from Czechoslovakia that they no longer consider me as being qualified to represent the country. It was a few days before I uh, actually could become an American citizen, a US citizen, which I was going to do, but postpone after this one more representation. To make one thing clear, we're not going to get into all of no, the details, no, no, but yeah. the, the man that you married was an American. Oh, yes, which yes, Which is yes. The, the root of all of this controversy. Oh, yeah, yeah, And this yes. is in the middle of the Cold War, okay. and it was not the done thing. That's exactly, yeah, exactly, exactly. When I came to the United States, maybe I should say, because I think uh, some of these recollections still mean something, especially today in, in this really difficult uh, world situation. There was a gentleman, Mr. Howland, representing the United States Department, Secretary Dulles. He told me, when you came to America, you just uh, learn for three years, or you can go and learn about America, and if you like it here, then become American citizens, and just stay away from politics. That's how it worked. And what I learned about America were two things. Some things I loved, 
and something I felt needed to be repaired. And the one thing that I think needed to be repaired was pretty much um, backwardness in women's athletics. That was very, and uh, in physical education, that was based in sports rather than physical fitness. And I think <laughs> this is so many years, and it stayed with me to this day. The women's athletics have gone up of course, and became professionalized, and it's a different story. But the physical education is still the great weakness of our society. We need to have fine physical education in schools. We will not have obesity among children. We will have much less uh, unhappy kids and much healthier population. And I'm devoting my life to that. When you moved to America, what were you most inspired by? You said you had lots of different emotions about this country, very different to your homeland. And you had gone through an awful lot as an individual. But you found essentially this country to be an inspiring place as an athlete. There was so much. I think the warmth of the people when we arrived on SS America to New York, the f <laughs> uh, you know, we were kind of known at that time, and there were there was lots of newspapers and publicity. Of course, you were known by your original name. Uh, oh yeah, Fikotova. I was named, which was Fikotova. Olga Fikotova. And I guess because it was difficult for people to pronounce, so I just became Olga. <laughs> I think till this day, most people know me as Olga. The warmest, I mean, welcome. I did get flowers from the mayor of New York, which was very, very, you know, be humbling, beautiful thing. But then I got a hug, and it was from Mr. Ed Sullivan. This we, is Ed Sullivan, the television presenter, and you went on his show. Yes, he invited us to his show. You were a huge celebrity at that time. <laughs> yes, we were. And he... And he just gave me a hug and he said, welcome, I will, you will love America and we love you. And then he said, I want you to meet somebody and took us, um, my husband, of course, and me. This is Harold, Harold Connolly. Harold Connolly took us to the dressing rooms uh, of the show. And there we met a man that I already have known his music because sometimes I could hear it in, in Prague and it was Louis Armstrong and he got up and he hugged me and kissed my cheek and he said I'll sing a special song for you and uh, said the same thing I hope you love America that was the first really re true first Impressions. The Ed Sullivan experience uh, and was you know, like being serenaded forever. in the dressing room, that, that's not just an ordinary first experience for anyone. That's a, a first experience as befitting a, a national hero. Uh, to me, it was not... <sighs> Look, very famous people, Mr. Sullivan, right, and Mr. Armstrong, very famous people, giving me just a normal human hug, a brotherly hug, right? and say, welcome here, and I felt at home. I wasn't impressed, indeed, what you're saying. I wasn't impressed that I'm on a TV show, because I, I had all that back at home, right? I had that in England. I have But there is something of human warmth that ties us all together. And at that point, what was your age when you just come to America, when you met Louis Armstrong? How old were you? Oh, I was 25, 25, I think it was 25, right? I know it's difficult to explain it, but that's how it was. I kind of could breathe and say, oh, yeah, I'm at home. I, so I got to do something real good here. Like, there's kind of like a follow-up to it, right? I, I was knowledgeable. I was a writer. I was a I had, I was fourth year of medical student. I had a lot of experience, and it was like, okay, I'll bring all that I have, and I'll use it here, because this is my home now. At that point, did you realize that you would probably spend the rest of your life in this country? I think, well, it's kind of a different level being at home. It's kind of being at home. I was at home in Australia, too. I got a lot of hugs and, uh, so we know, from Australians, right? It was like, 
yeah, the world opens, and the world is my home. I don't mean it like I'm so important. I just mean that I can live anywhere, I think. The humans are the same family. I'm sorry, I'm just repeating the same thing, but I, it's just my soul talking, you know? I think a lot of this has to do with your personality, though. You're a very, very giving, welcoming personality, the kind of person I think people want to communicate with and to talk to and I think that is borne out in in the work that you do here so let's talk about what you do here and what you've been doing for the last few years how did your career transition from being an, an athlete and as I say you went on to compete in several more Olympic games but then you transitioned into education and to coaching and, and to training right. so how did that happen so I competed in four Olympic games in for United representing United States, but I also had four kids, right? So I had a husband, a family, and everything. And training has changed. Training had become much more uh, intense. Uh, so it was impossible for me to continue. Also, my kids were part of my body, and, and so whatever I brought in is a part of my body, I also put my mind and spirit into them because I wanted them to be very best humans of what I think humans are, you know. Humans have this great, wonderful potential, and that was my, till this day, <laughs> dedication, right? At that time, there came a point that I realized there's no way I, I can compete anymore except for the fun of it. But I just, I'm not good about competing for the fun of it. I was used to be a competitor. Compete to win, weren't compete you? Compete to win in that sense. Compete was the best I can get out of me. But I can't get the best out of me after I, I made all the breakfast, dinners, laundry, and studying and lecturing and everything. It became really avocation. I just worked out. Well, anyway. But I think also every athlete at the top of their game gets to a point in their career when they realise they can't win again at that level. Yeah. And there has to be a second career. There has to be a second career. I still loved athletics. I still loved everything. I studied what can I do. But because of my desire of improvement on really physical education... I went back to school to, to Orange Coast College and to work for specialists in fitness training, and I became that. And then by a chance, I got a call from UCI if I would like to do a wellness class. If I, could I do that? And I said, sure. And in between, I was coaching throwers at Orange Coast. Then I started teaching here, and then I realized that there is more to a human body than muscles and bones and large muscle groups. And I took another course to become exercise therapist that goes much deeper into training. And my gosh, I wish the trainers, the, the sports coaches would all learn a little bit more about the human body also. From exercise therapy, you learn a lot, and you can take a person, motivate a person, and if that person really loves himself or herself, they will refurbish themselves to a very joyful state at the age of 67 or whenever. So here you are, almost 60 years since you came to the United States, still training, yeah. still working yeah. in sports. Yeah. Tell me about an average day in your life as it is now as you work here, as you train people. Oh. Tell, tell me about an average day. Well, my average day is, uh, it changes a little bit because I do personal training and then I do uh, group training and other things. So, for example, most of my clients here are uh, teachers or administrators. They start their work at 8 or 8.30. So I train just about every morning at 6 in the morning. So I have to get up. I get up like 4.30. I don't need to get up so early, but I like to take my time in the morning to stretch a little bit and eat a little bit something and stop at Starbucks. This is not an advertising. It's, that's how things are. And come and then train. And then I get, I'm pretty serious about training. And uh, I, I, we work out with 
me and whoever an hour or a little over an hour. After that, sometimes I work up myself. At noontime, twice a week, I work with groups of people here in the park who are uh, employees, the university employees, uh, most of them office employees who are, you know, afflicted the technology, the technology diseases of sitting at a computer all the time and uh, not knowing that they need to rest their eyesight, that they have to change their postures. And so so we, we work on office ergonomics. What do you think of fun. this idea that you often hear about these days that sitting is the new smoking? Well, you know, everybody always comes with something. Let's and the, go. the idea being that we all sit too much at, at yeah, office desks. Yeah, it is true. It all goes to how you balance your days, right? Even though you sit at the computer, it really shouldn't keep you to get up for one or two or three minutes every hour. Stretch a little bit. There is something called 20-20-20. After each 20 minutes, you should take 20 seconds and look 20 feet away from the computer to protect your eyes. The way you have your office desk as it's aligned, the way you'd have your chair, you can change positions. You can do an all kinds of uh, good isometric or stretching exercises within a minute or two. And sometimes you stand when you can. You stand and you don't, you don't have to go to a Xerox machine and just kind of blank out and watch the papers hurling through. But you can do toe raises. You can uh, do all kinds of exercises. I teach my people to do those exercises and not to feel silly doing that because it keeps them healthy and prevents all that atrophy that certain parts of the body go through by not being used. What is atrophy? Atrophy means that uh, when uh, any part of the body, any muscles that you don't use just weaken because the body is very economical. When you don't use something, the body will give that part only the minimum nutrition and a minimum oxygenation and takes the bulk of it and puts it to the parts that you do use. Originally, we have been built on moving the whole body there is only one activity that safely and everybody can do that as long as it's, it has no disadvantage, right? And it's walking. Walking today, all your body is involved in walking, even jogging too. So everybody can do that every day and counterbalance sitting. Or when as a sitting... You can stretch, you can raise your arms, you can bend down, you can touch your toes, you can turn to the right, to the left. You can do exercises, let's say, every hour for three minutes, and it will pull you through. You have to appreciate your body. You have to appreciate your hands, your feet, your neck. You have to have a connection with the body. And when I teach it, I teach feeling more than anything else. And if my, my may say one more thing, and that's just my, me, that I don't say it's right or wrong, I don't use music, I, except sometimes for the fun of it, maybe some Strauss waltzes for warming up or whatever, but not the beat of music. I haven't music. been to many gyms in California that play Strauss waltzes right. while we're working out. <laughs> <laughs> right, but you see, if you play Strauss and you say, okay, warm up, any way you want to, it dance like for five minutes. Anything, just keep moving for five minutes. That's a good little warm-up. But if you have a music that just gives you beat, 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 then the music is maybe not to be for a person who has long legs, short legs, who is heavier, who is lighter. Everybody is trying to satisfy the beat and takes away a proper conditioning of the body. That's why I'm mm. not using that. I use laughter. We laugh a lot because laughter is the best oxygenator. And it, in the old times in the gym, 
even the Muscle Beach gyms at Venice, those great weightlifters, you know, Joe Gold and those... Arnold Schwarzenegger. Arnold Schwarzenegger. You ever, you ever met him? Dave, I've never met him, but he was a good friend of my ex-husband. They would kid each other. They would shout. They would laugh. It's no longer like that. People come to the gym now like they are going to a war place with a grumpy face, and they have to fight the treadmill for 45 minutes. I think it's sad because, among others, by not laughing, talking, and breathing, we rob ourselves of oxygenation. Can I ask you about your own fitness regime? What do you do? I just work out on whatever pleases me that day. I do a lot of rowing machine. Do you lift weights? Yeah, sometimes. Yeah. I lifted weights for so many years that there was a point when I swore myself never to touch weights again. <laughs> okay. But I still do. Sometimes the machine, sometimes the free weights. I do all like deadlifts, <laughs> whatever, you know. A kind of an exercise when you almost go from a deadlift to a press. I don't do snatches and whatever because my knees are not solid. I do some dumbbells. Do you do push-ups? I do push-ups because I have to at least show one or two. You see, <laughs> when I have a client or talk to somebody, I always have to show, be able to show them. You can't motivate people just telling them what to do. If you haven't at least experienced it, so you can say this or that you will feel, right? Or you show it. I, I am not a fitness fanatic. I just like to have everything in me in working condition where I need it. I do walk a lot on the beach. Then of the, when I have time in the morning, I head to the beach and I, I do some uh, walking in deep sand, some jogging in the surf. I do that kind of activities. So you have clients of varying ages, some oh, yeah. much younger than yourself. Some of your clients are actually quite a bit older than you. Right, right. I'm not worried very much about the age of people. I, I just try to find out where they are physically. You know, you always have to find out uh, certain things if people have a heart condition or... Uh, what medications they they take, and anything that can uh, influence uh, your functionality. And if the, there is something a little bit more serious, I automatically uh, ask for the permission or whatever to contact the doctors and work with the doctor and so forth. And some some are just fine, like Edith over here, right? Edith has just joined us, oh. and she is 100 years old. Hello, Edith. Hi. There nice to meet you. Hi, it's good to see you. Thank you for coming to see us today. Uh, you are, I'm correct in saying, 100 years old. Yeah. Just uh, a few months ago. October 11. And you've been training with Olga here. Yeah. When she was 99. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of training did that involve for you, Edith? Well, I did a lot of walking, bicycling and using the machine for my getting my feet going and various items. And did you improve? Did you get better? Oh, I think so, yes. I started out with my sticks, which I love. A friend of mine years back got them for me when I was having balance problems, and they were a savior for me because I could go for walks by myself, and the sticks exercised my arms as well as my legs, and I was happy with them, but <laughs> I'm try trying to get off the, tra off the sticks. And I test myself by holding both sticks in one hand and walking. So, of course, I wasn't using my sticks to help then. She would walk the running track and near the inner railing. So she would have the security that if she would lose balance, she could grab to the railing. And I would just have the sticks. So she was bra breaking her mental dependency on the sticks. It's not that I wouldn't want her to use them, but when you become dependent on the stick, then uh, you lose uh, confidence in you being the strength of walking. So we, 
we had the sticks nearby, but I, I could see that her legs are strong because she rides the bicycle for 40 minutes, right? So uh, she would walk without the sticks, and that was mainly a mental thing. Then uh, we tried walking backwards, sideways, and um, her mind and body remembered all that. And so we just had fun. We've done a lot of getting up and sitting down type of exercises to strengthen basically the core and to s strengthen the, the hips and the, all the parts that we sit on all the time. So just keep them active. And I guess, Edith, the moral of this story is that it's never too late. It's You're never, never too old to start something like this. Use it or lose it. And you're That's pretty much using it. That's what I tell myself. <laughs> <laughs> and when I'm at the home now, they don't like me to go alone, but I think that's the only way to keep my strength. So I go with my sticks and often carry the, carry the sticks in one hand and just walk because that's what I'm training to do is to walk. So the sticks are just a little bit of insurance. Yes, just in case. exactly. Uh, they mm. make me feel safe when I'm out alone. Some of the senior homes, uh, even a good one, they have certain rules, don't they? And their safety rules yeah. ask for a cane or a stick. Yeah. So it's, she can't, like, say, I'll do without it because by the rules she has to have them. You know, the, everything has its strong and weak, weak part to it. Now I'm enrolled in, for physical therapy starting next Monday. And one point about it is that I have to walk to get there. By my, I don't have to. I could go by bus, but that's so cumbersome to have to wait for the bus and wait for them to pick you up and all. So I am looking forward to walking to the place where I get my physical therapy. And you mentioned the home. You live in a independent living establishment. So yeah. you essentially look after yourself. A very expensive for me place where I get my food and I get my bed and a little bit of exercise, not much, not nearly enough at the home. Do you tell them that you'd rather have more exercise? Oh, yes, yes, yes. I think we have chair exercises up to three times a week. And that's for about 45 minutes, maybe, when we do things in our chairs. They're very simple exercises, and I think that's the use it or lose it policy. If I don't do that simple stuff, I'll lose that too. So there's that, and then there's some wonderful game called balloon volleyball, my favorite. <laughs> How much of your progress do you think in terms of physical exercise and perhaps not needing the sticks all the time has to do with your frame of mind and your attitude towards aging? I'm not a very happy person right now, the way my life is going. And it's hard to explain, but I think the mere fact of being stuck in a home with a lot of people who are physically not right, you know, makes you feel like you're an ancient person, that you're not worth much. You're stuck in here with a bunch of people who need an awful lot of care. And being there with I don't know how many, 60 women or more. Some of them are very intelligent, very nice, and it takes a long time to weed them out of the entire group. And they want me to take part in all the activities, all the games, all the card games, all the bingo and all that stuff, which doesn't interest me. But I go to everything that has to do with my physical well-being, and there isn't enough of that at that house. But it's not the most expensive house. I could go to one that costs a lot more. But somehow I'm trying to preserve some of my assets for my kids. Well, this is the great dilemma, isn't it, for, for so many people as yeah. they age and get older, that you need a certain amount of security and assistance. Yeah. But you maintain and need to maintain your independence. Yeah. And you are able still to do an awful lot for yourself. Most Dis of despite my your stuff great I can age take of 100. care of, like I paid my monthly bill this morning. I left it there at the office. If I waited till tomorrow, I'd get a late fee. So I'm very careful about stuff like that. 
apart from your living situation, are you happy about being your age, 100 years old? I don't mind being my age as long as I can be respected for my age. But I think old people are put so many times, wait here, wait here, wait here, wait here. And I hear that complaint so often. They tell me, we'll do this for you, but wait here. And there's a lot of time spent waiting, waiting, waiting. If you go on the bus somewhere, you go with a bunch of people who have different desires, different wishes, different things to shop for. And you can spend a whole day on a bus with people doing one thing for you and one thing for somebody else, and and you waste a whole day going on the bus, which, I don't know, doesn't uh, set too well with me. For the physical therapy next week, there is a bus that goes sometimes. I have to uh, alert them. I have, I have to always keep in touch with the driver to find out when is he going to leave, how long do I have to wait after I'm through with my exercise to come home, and all that rigmarole irks me. So I'm thinking that I'm going to try to get there all the time by walking. It's not a long walk. How far is it? Two blocks. You know, you have to know the way. And when you get to the building, you don't know where your personal therapist is. You have to go through a rigmarole there. But I've got it down pat. A friend went with me yesterday. We we went over the the trip together because she's been there. And so I have in my head now exactly how to get there. And it'll take about, I think, 35 minutes walking to get there. So I can be there in 35 minutes, and when I'm through, I can come home and be home in 35 minutes. But if I wait for the bus, I have to maybe wait till the afternoon. You just don't know. You're dependent on somebody else always for a bus ride. I gather from Olga that you're writing a book about aging. I haven't gotten very far with it. (laughs) I've been thinking of starting a new chapter now because since I've been in the home, my life has changed in so many ways. And there are so many things I have to learn when I get there that seem so unimportant. Like I was there for two weeks and nobody had taken my towels, my bath towels. And I mentioned that to the girls at my table and they said, Oh, you have to throw them on the floor if they take them to the laundry. That was news to me. I never threw anything on the floor to go to the laundry. Why wasn't that in rule number one when I went there? And something like that turns up all the time that's irksome. Well, I tell you what, I think your insights into your current situation and your life more generally and and the aging process and, and how you're dealing with it are fascinating and I would love to come back and and talk to you for a a future podcast if that would be okay and we'll sit down and talk for a couple of hours I'd I'd really like that it's really good you're welcome really really good to talk to you and I look forward to talking in more detail at some point in the future thank you well Olga that was fascinating to meet Edith Aviz there a hundred years old and she clearly has quite a story to tell yeah (laughs) she is very coherent and very careful how she expresses her feelings. So she's very truthful. I will, as I said there, go back and talk to her again for for a future podcast because I think the dilemmas that she has and and the struggles that she is going through are are compelling. And they are issues and problems that face so many people, not necessarily they get to 100, but maybe they get to 70 or 75 or 80 and similar challenges face them. so. I don't know, some of the places are like warehousing people, you know. Other places may be much more accommodative to individual, like individual needs and individuality of the people. I really don't know. I uh, personally, I dread it. I, I, uh, I think that if you are very weak and ill and whatever, it's a totally different story. But if you are really not ill, she's not ill. She is becoming weaker. It may even be that her immune system is becoming weaker. 
she's losing will to live. She just says, well, I guess I'll be there until I die. And that's it now. My style is not to be adding years to life, but adding life to years. Somebody else said that, right? Adding quality to the final and quality, years. quality, life to years. Well, um, some people describe it as improving your health span as opposed to your lifespan, that your health span, health span. the number of years oh, that you that's, yes, optimize that's even what you have. Said. Yes, maybe people have not been taught that. You said you dread know. a situation or you dread a scenario, perhaps where you're very old and you're right. already 84 years old, but where you're at such a great age that you cannot physically do the kind of things that you right. enjoy doing now. Well, um, or, any, or something else, right? So let's say, uh, let's say I cannot right now high jump. I'd love to high jump, but I have a bad knee, right? So I can't high jump. So I do something else, right? Uh, uh, but but I can do something with my body and my mind and feel alive. I don't know re really how to explain it. There's an, an energy that's uh, that's being connected with nature. I think connected with the heartbeat of nature. It's freedom. It's just freedom. The one person who said it long, long time ago, was Lao Tzu. Lao Tzu said, be aware of your mortality, but live as if you were immortal. Now, that's something that I, I would like to do. It does not have the mechanical uh, explanation, but I think I would like to be able to have the physical, and mental, and spiritual reaches open so I can live as if I'm immortal while I'm aware of my mortality. That is a great way to end this, I okay. think. And I, okay, absolutely. I wish you many, many more <laughs> healthy and active years. Olga, it has been great to talk to you. Thank you very much. Okay, you're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> And what a pleasure it was to meet Olga Connolly and her friend Edith. And as Olga said there, she always does her due diligence when taking on new clients. And you should always consult your doctor if you're considering a new workout regime or diet. This podcast doesn't provide medical advice. Well, that's it for episode two. Thanks for listening. Our website is llamapodcast.com and we're on Facebook and Twitter at Llama Podcast. <laughs> <laughs>